All right. I'm only given one talk at this conference. It's like a vacation here. Um, okay, so let's, uh, I know we just prayed to the Holy Spirit, which is crucial for the talk I'm about to give. Trust me, I might have to run out the side doors after this one. We're, we're going to get busy on this talk. Okay, so I want to I wanna also pray a Hail Mary so that Our Lady covers me, cloaks me, and shields me from anybody who's going to hate me at the end of this talk. And that hearts would be open. That's my prayer as a priest, that hearts would be open to what you hear. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death, amen. Saint Joseph. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. All right. So, I don't know if, do you think that I'm talking on St. Joseph for the rosary or something? Oh, okay. Because in one of the flyers, I saw that, and I'm like, wait, that's not my talk. So, I was hoping I wasn't going to disappoint a bunch of people today. My talk is about the Eucharist. It's called Perpetual Eucharistic Revival. And um, this is only, I think, the third time that I've given this talk. And so I'm still fine-tuning it. And you'll see what I mean as, as I go through it. Because we hit some heavy stuff in this talk that needs to be said. And I got nothing to lose, so I'll do it. I signed up for this to walk to Calvary and to die. And so many of you are going to be comforted by this message, and you're going to be like, finally, a dude with a Roman collar on is saying this stuff. But some of you are going to be like, they ordained that dude? That guy's a psycho. You're laughing now, but some of you, you're going to be like, oh, boy. <laughs> I say everything with love, really and truly. I only say this because I've been a priest now 21 years. I want you to fall more madly in love with Jesus Christ, to make him the center of your everything. Because believe it or not, God, who is God, he's divine, he's kind of like made you the center of everything. He's so in love with you. He's madly in love with you. The saints call God a divine madman. They really do. Like St. Faustina calls him basically a lunatic. <laughs> Read her diary. Why do you love us so much? You seem to be crazy because of what we do to you and how we treat you, and yet you don't turn away from us, and you're so good to us. You know, in life, everybody wants to be happy. I do. You do. Everybody does. I have yet to meet a person who wakes up in the morning and says, you know what, I want today to just totally suck. <laughs> I want to have a horrible day. I want everything to go wrong. I want to lose my job, my family, my income. I want to be homeless. I want everything to be as bad as it could be. I haven't met that person yet. Because everybody wants to be happy. So you know what I see a lot today? And you see it here too. I'm sure that you do in North Carolina. I see it everywhere because I travel constantly. People are trying to consume happiness. I used to do this. If you know my conversion story, you know I used to put a little liquid Lucy on my tongue, go dance with the bears at a Grateful Dead show, and smoke a little doobage, you know. I, I was trying to consume happiness. It didn't work. But today, it's amazing how in city after city, and now it's in Europe and it's, it's, it's all over the world, edibles. I see grannies in line at the edibles, you know, store. I do. Everybody wants to seek to consume a little bit of happiness, take the edge off, right? Take away the nerves and just find a little happiness. Oh, you might be happy for 20 minutes, an hour or two, whatever, but it's, it doesn't work. If only love could be consumed, if only happiness could be consumed, that'd be awesome. Can Happiness be consumed? Can love be consumed? Huh. 
Yeah, it can. You know, I'll put it to you this way, in, in an analogy, right? Everybody loves babies. I love babies. Even the most hardcore, woke, neo-Nazi feminist loves a baby. Seriously. Sees a little cute, little fat, little baby in a little thing going down the street, turns away from her wokeness. Oh, right? Everybody loves a little baby. And when you see a little baby, you want to consume that little baby. Everybody turns into a madman and a lunatic when they see a baby. You see that little fat little baby belly and you go, I'm going to eat you up. Yum, 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 yum. I'm going to eat you up, right? And you put your lips into its fat little baby belly and you, you talk gibberish. You lose your mind. You lose your faculties. You're not making sense. You're crazy. And if that baby had reason, he'd be like, security, right? This dude's about to eat me, right? We don't eat babies. You would be a madman if you did something like that. But we, we, we lose our minds, so to speak, when we see something so adorable. It's a little bundle of joy, we say, right? Right. But we don't eat babies. But there was one baby who was born to be consumed. Jesus. The God-man. The God-baby. You know, it's amazing. So many people, th people think that Catholics made this stuff up, like about the Eucharist and Holy Communion, that God is truly present in that. Because so many Christian churches don't believe that. They think it's just a symbol. And when they're done with their service, they just chuck it, and the grape juice that they use to, you know, they just dump it down the drain. But the Catholic Church teaches from the very beginning that Holy Communion in the Catholic Church is truly the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. The ultimate edible. God consumable. Happiness consumable. For you. Okay, I'm doing good so far. We're going we to get heavy in a minute, okay? We're going to get heavy. We'll see who's clapping. So... You know, when in the scriptures, it's right in the Bible, by the way. The Catholic Church didn't, didn't fudge this and make it up to try and get everybody to be Catholic, which is the ultimate goal, by the way, right? That's why I became a priest. I didn't become a priest to affirm you in your paganism. I'm here to convert you. That's what I'm all about. So in the scriptures, we actually hear about the true bread come down from heaven, born in Bethlehem. Do you know what Bethlehem means in Hebrew? House of bread, not making this up. Do you know what it means in Aramaic? House of flesh or meat. Seriously, not making it up. You can do the studies. Whoa. And where was the true bread come down from heaven, born in the house of bread, house of flesh, placed in a manger? From where we get the word manjare, eat, your animals. That's where animals eat. We're a bunch of sinners. We're not worthy of this bread. But he came to be consumed, was placed in a, in a feeding trough where, where animals eat. That's you and me. That's Christianity. And Jesus himself says serious stuff. Read the Gospel of John sometime, chapter 6 specifically, where he says, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. Hello. That, that's serious talk. And he means it. And we as Catholics, we believe this. And we are so blessed. We have the answer. If only the world would humble themselves and accept the gift of faith to believe this. This is what the saints say about this great mystery, the ultimate edible, Jesus Christ and Holy Communion. There's this one saint from Canada, not well known, but her name is Blessed Dina Bellanger, I think that's how you pronounce it, or Bellinger. Bellanger. This is what she said. Listen to this. This is the saints, man. If souls understood what treasure they possess in the divine Eucharist, it would be necessary to protect tabernacles with impregnable ramparts because in the delirium of a holy and devouring hunger... They would go themselves to feed on the manna of the seraphim. Churches at night, as in daytime, would overflow with worshipers wasting away with love for the august prisoner. Right. So right, sister. 
But is that happening today? No, it's not happening today. People today, when mass is over, gone, man. Don't even wait for mass to be over. Can't get out of that parking lot fast enough. What's wrong with this picture? A lot. You know, just in, what was five years ago now, 2019, a survey was taken in North America that showed, it hurts me to say this, 69%, you might as well round up, 70% of Catholics no longer believe that Jesus is truly present, body, blood, soul, and divinity, and Holy Communion, the Blessed Sacrament, the Eucharist. 70%. What happened? That's a shocking figure. You know what's even more shocking? Just a week and a half ago, a survey was taken in Italy. Italy, dude. Do you know how, what the percentage is of, of Italians that are going to church right now? 10%. So what does that mean? 90% of them no longer believe. What? Italy? Like the mothership of Christianity. How is that even possible? Well, there's a lot of reasons. I don't have another time to go into all the reasons. That would be another talk. And they would shock you. And I'd probably get canceled. Right? That's why I did social media last year. Because I'm like, bro, you putting a big target on your face with the stuff that I say. But I have to say it. I'm trying to, you know, go a little more before they get me, right? It's unbelievable what's happening today. What, what happened? What happened? That, and, and, again, as a priest, I take zero delight in saying this to you. And I'm not saying it to be a meanie. I'm not saying it, you know, to, to, to dr make drama. You can do the searches on Google and YouTube and watch the videos yourself. But, you know, just a couple months ago, a few examples. In South America, there was a mass presided over by a bishop. And someone came up to receive Holy Communion that had all the vestiges of being a Muslim. And Holy Communion was given to that person by the bishop. And people thought, oh, dude, right? Like, well, maybe he didn't know, you know, maybe converted, but he's still wearing the attire of, like, you know, that stuff, and so maybe he didn't know. So give him the benefit of the doubt. Okay, good. So they asked the bishop, did you know that, I mean, what was the situation there? Oh, he knew, and he didn't care. And he defended it. Oh, yes, this is a sign of our brotherhood, universal brotherhood. And wrong answer. Your Excellency, wrong answer. That is not going to bring about unity and brotherhood. What are you doing? But they defend it. Many of them defend it. Or just a few months ago in Mexico, I love Mexico. I go there every year, love it. You can watch the videos. There was a first Holy Communion for little girls. Oh, these girls were so beautiful, dressed up, ready to receive Jesus. And there they are, and they go up, and one of them decides to get down on her knees and to receive Jesus on her knees, on her tongue. Do you know what happened? The priest told, scolded her in front of all of her friends, in front of her own parents. Padre, it's a good thing I wasn't that girl's dad. I'm going to tell you right now, that would not go well for you, bro. How dare you? Who do you think you are? You forced that girl to get up, humiliated her in front of all of her friends, and told her that she could only receive in the hand? You will pay for what you have done. This nonsense has gone on for too long. Something needs to be done. Why would you even become a priest to do something like that? What is wrong with you? What is in your heart and in your mind? I don't know. I don't want to know. It's scary to think about it. We've gotten into this crisis right now where it, it's crazy out there. You know this. And because of this craziness, God bless our bishops here in the States, they've started this Eucharistic revival. Great. I support it. Wonderful. 
Are any of you going to the thing in Indianapolis this July? Wonderful. Have a great time. It's going to be awesome. You're going to have great speakers there. Many of them are my friends. Awesome. I wasn't invited. <laughs> no. Nah. I don't know why. It ain't a thing. I'm speaking already on the same weekend. I couldn't be there anyway, even if they did. But I'm kind of, you know, a loose cannon. So, you know, they got to, you know. So, but if I had been, I'm going to give you the talk now that I would give. Because there are things that need to be said with love. I'm not condemning anybody. I'm not judging anybody. I don't know your interior life. I don't. I don't. But as a priest who loves you, this is why I became, I didn't do this to be a celibate social worker. I'd be an idiot if I did that. I did this to save souls and to give you the truth. And sometimes that medicine hurts and it stings because you're not used to it. Many people have been living in darkness, like in a cave. And when you're about to hear the things that I'm about to say, you're going to be like, whoa. <laughs> whoa. I would have said the same thing when I converted to Catholicism because like many people, I didn't know many of these things. And I myself, even after being a priest 21 years, I'm still learning things. But see, you can go to events and hear great talks, motivated, and get all emotional. And that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. I do that all the time. But if the talks don't contain substance, action plan, for real effective change that will affect a perpetual Eucharistic adoration, it's just a weekend thing or maybe a week. There are things that we can do that will rub a lot of people the wrong way, but if they're willing to humble themselves and realize, you know what, that stung me, dude. I wanted to throw a book in your face. I want to punch you in the mouth, dude. But when I went home and I took that to prayer, I think you're right. The only way we're going to get out of this is if we do stuff like what I'm about to tell you. Ready? All right. You know, when I converted to Catholicism, I would go church hopping. Now, I've been a Catholic for like 30 years. I've been a priest for 21. I would go to different Catholic churches. I wouldn't go into the other ones, you know. <laughs> no thanks. I want the real one, right? So I'm going to different Catholic churches, seeing how that dude preaches and what they got going on and whatnot. And you know, so many of the times, I'd say three-fourths of the times, I couldn't even find Jesus. Where's the tabernacle? No wonder we got 70% of people that don't believe in the real presence because they can't even find Jesus in his own house. Why have the tabernacles been removed from the sanctuaries? Did he do something wrong? Did he get busted? Is he being punished? He's behind a wall and down the hallway, room you know, 7A is where the tabernacle is. Why? What's up with that? And some people will say, well, you know, if you had read the documents of Vatican II, it says, no, it doesn't, homie. No, it doesn't. I read them a lot. It says the tabernacle should be in a prominent place. Anybody with a brain, a noggin, knows prominent place means like front and center, bro. Not hiding him. No wonder we got a crisis. No wonder so many people when they come into a Catholic church, and I watch them genuflect, and I see grown men doing like some curtsy. Brother, knee to the ground, soldier, because you don't know. You don't know who's truly present there. You don't know what's going on. People are so confused today about this. And still you can go and find churches. you you got to hunt down Jesus. Where's Jesus? I remember when I was a seminarian. It's a good thing I had a long formation, by the way, because I was like bottled thunder in the seminary. You know, they were like, wow, when this dude gets ordained, <laughs> oh, boy, you know. I remember going home to my parents' parish. Well, no, it wasn't their parish. I went home, and I got invited to a prayer group to give a talk. And I was all excited, seminary, and all fired up, zealous, you know. And I go over there and give the talk, and I'm, I'm a couple minutes into the talk, and I'm disturbed interiorly because I'm like, I don't know where Jesus is. I haven't seen the red candle. I don't know where the tabernacle is, so I stopped it. And I'm like, where's Jesus? And they said, oh, he's down the hallway back in the, in the room. And I'm like, all right, hold on. And I start walking away, and they're like, where are you going? I'm like, I'm going to go bring him in here. I was going to go pick up that tabernacle and bring it in there and put him where he should be. And they were like, no, 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 you can't do that. Father, the pastor is going to be super upset. And I'm like, I'm going to do it. This is where he belongs. He didn't belong down in the hallway. And they're like, no, don't do that. You're going to cause so much trouble. And I'm like, fine. And, you know, they were right on some level. I shouldn't have been the one to do it. It should have been him. That's his job, dude. 
That's why you signed up for this. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. I want to read you another quote from a guy that I just found out about last year. This guy's off the charts. Relatively unknown um, outside of Spain. His name is St. Manuel Gonzalez Garcia. He was a bishop in Spain. Known as the Bishop of the Abandoned Tabernacle. I'm going to read a quote from him. And it's a really long quote, but I'm only going to take a section, and then I'll, tell you, I'll paraphrase the rest of it. This is what he said verbatim. I do not want in my life as a bishop that my soul be distressed except for one single disgrace, which is the biggest of all, the abandonment of the tabernacle, and that it may rejoice in only one soul happiness, the tabernacle accompanied. There's a lot of talk about accompaniment these days. How about we start accompanying Jesus? How about we start getting close to Jesus, especially the Blessed Sacrament? You know what this bishop goes on to say? He says, I'm not here to be the bishop of the poor. I'm not here to be the bishop of this cause. Today, you know what he would say, because he, he lived about 80 years ago or so. He would say so, probably something like this. I hope he's not upset, but I think he would affirm it from heaven. He, he would say, I'm not here to be the bishop of ecology or Mother Nature, or illegal immigration. No. Mm -mm. I'm here to be the bishop of the abandoned tabernacle. Jesus is what Christianity is all about. Seek first the kingdom of God, and you get all things. Seek first the kingdom of men, you don't get jack. Seriously. That's how it works. Put Jesus first primary in your life, you'll get all the other stuff because you'll do good works that flow from that. But if you have it upside down, you're going to get like 70% of people, Catholics, no longer believing in the real presence. Why? Because you put the focus on other things that aren't bad. The Catholic Church is the most charitable organization on a daily basis on the planet. We smoke everybody else. Nobody even comes close. Your little Santa Claus is standing outside of Walmart with their little jingle thing at Christmas time please. We do more to help the poor and ecology, planting trees and whatnot, than anybody. And yet we have the greatest treasure, and we hide it. We have the edible. We have happiness, consumable, and we seem to be ashamed of it. We have clergy who would deny people to receive it on the tongue will shame them in front of their friends and give it to non-believers who don't even believe that Jesus is God. What? That's the state of things right now. That's the kind of stuff that we need to be talking about with great love. Not condemning anybody, not judging anybody, but saying, guys, guys, if we want to revive this thing, if we want to turn this ship around, this is the stuff we got to address with mad love, crazy love. But it's got to be said from the highest levels, but it's not, and that breaks my heart. I converted to Catholicism because I fell madly in love with the prisoner in the tabernacle. What has happened to the bride of Christ? What has happened to the church? Let's keep going. We're going to get in some real dangerous territory here now. So many people don't know how to receive Jesus. Priest 21 years. Almost every time that I celebrate Mass or can celebrate Mass and distribute Holy Communion, I go to Calvary. Because of what I see coming up in the line, if it's doing this to me, because I'm not Padre Pio, I don't read souls, right? Don't panic, you know. But I don't need to read souls to be able to see what's right in front of me. My eyes tell me what I'm observing. We're in a bad way. We're in a bad way. What do I mean specifically? The church allows us to receive communion two ways. One is by way of exception, not the norm. And it's allowed but only permitted. Now, this is going to shock probably half of you. Communion in the hand is not the norm. <gasps> what? I'm writing the bishop. It's in the documents, guys. 
I'm not, this isn't Father Callaway because I got a microphone making this up. It's in the documents. You just haven't read them. You haven't been exposed to them. Does that mean that you sh cannot receive communion in the hand? No. The church allows it by way of exception. It's not the norm. Why? Because of the possibilities of profanation. Do you know about this? Well, let me tell you what I see as a priest now for 21 years on a daily basis, people coming up. I see people who drop the host. I see people who walk away with the host in their hands, and I have to stop the communion line. Hey, excuse me, please, you have to consume the host. And they look at me like I'm, I'm, I'm from another planet. I've found consecrated hosts in pews and books under pews with gum taped to the pew. Really, how many people when they come up to receive communion in the hand, which you're allowed to do, I'm not saying you can't do, the church allows it, I'm not magisterium, but how many people when they come up, they don't even know how to hold their hand? I see it constantly, my friends. If you had my vision where I stood, when you come up, you'd see what I see. It's horrible. It's horrible. People's hands like this, you know, like in a V. What am I supposed to do with this? Bro, you can't make a flat hand for me, right? Unless you got some anomaly, you're crippled in the hand or something, fine, but most people are not. So, bro, a V? Or how many people, when they even do have a flat hand, I place the host, the body of Christ, and I place our Lord on the palm of their hand, they just, they don't even look, they just consume, walk away, you know, they don't look to see if there's any pieces left. Now, you don't want to become paranoid about this. If there's such a small piece that you can't, you would never even know that it's a piece of bread. Well, there's theology about that. You know, okay, you don't have to be paranoid about it. But if you just got a host, Jesus, place in your hand, and you don't even look to see if there's an identifiable piece left, which the majority of you don't, that's a problem. That's a problem. Why? Because, friends, there have been studies done. A friend of mine did it. It's shocking. If I had two communion lines, let's say this line is going to receive in the hand. Fine. This line is going to receive on the tongue. Under both lines, let's place a black sheet. What are we going to observe when communion is done in this line? A lot of pieces on the ground. I'm not kidding. Look up the YouTube videos. People have done this. Not with a consecrated host, obviously but just an unconsecrated one, showing what can take place. Will you find pieces on the ground in this line? You might. It's not that receiving on the tongue is going to prevent it. That's why a lot of times they put some form of a, 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 a plate, right, Under, a ciborium underneath so that in case something does fall. Right. But it, it could still happen. A little piece could be on the priest's finger, and, and, and it doesn't fall on, on, the, on, the, on the plate, right, and it falls on the ground. So it could happen. And, in fact, in these videos, it did but not to the same degree that it happened on this side. Wouldn't you, if you were madly, madly in love with Jesus Christ, want to try your utmost to prevent it? I know I do. I know I do. Wouldn't a saint want to do that? Now, am I saying that you can't receive in the hand? No, that's not what I'm saying. When I give out Holy Communion, if someone comes up to me and says, I say the body of Christ, they stuck out their hand, do I give them communion in the hand? I do. I'm not going to refuse it. The church allows it, permits it, by way of exception. It's in all the documents. And in my latest book, I actually cite it. Just in case you think I'm going rogue, I'm not. I got the citations from the official Vatican documents in the back. But am I going to let the people who receive on the tongue get away with, you know, no, no kind of lashing? No. Why? because I have to say it breaks my heart too when so many people come up to receive communion on the tongue and they don't know what they're doing. Seriously. What do I observe? I'm going to tell you what I observe. Because a lot of people will think, oh, well, you know, it should be outlawed, communion on the hand. I'm not saying it shouldn't. I hope we get there someday. We're not ready for it yet, but that's, I would like to see that happen because then we ain't got to worry about th those kind of abuses where people steal hosts. When I put the host in your mouth, you're not going to be able to steal it and go to do some satanic ritual with it, which, by the way, happens a lot. You'd be shocked at how often that that happens. I have to stop people at almost every mass that I go to. I didn't have to do it today, 
But because I travel so much in parishes, like at a conference like this, you assume that you guys are like devout Catholics. But you go to your average parish, I have to stop the line because somebody is trying to get a host. Seriously, I don't know what their intentions are. And sometimes you ask them, what, what, why did you do that? Oh, well, I'm going to go back and have a holy hour at my house. <laughs> nah, big fat no. Okay? Or I'm going to go take half of it to my husband. Yeah, big fat no. Unless you got the permission of the pastor and you're an ex commission extraordinary minister of Holy Communion, you're not an ordinary minister of Holy Communion. Yeah, that's dangerous territory, I know. We'll save that for another talk. All right. So, when people come up to receive on the tongue, like the saints did for like a long time, what do I observe, though? This. Remember Gene Simmons? Yeah, kiss. Or are you familiar with New Zealand, the, the, the haka, right? Ah, you know, people come up, and I'm like, bro. You, it's like the body of, yo, yo. It's like, you're scaring me. You're like, you don't have to go tongue to the chin, you know, on me. And this is why I encourage you, I really do, practice at home in a mirror. If you're self-conscious about this, and I get that, I think God understands that. When I converted to Catholicism, I was initially receiving in the hand, and that was fine. The church allows it. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with that. There isn't. But then at one point, I saw all these devout Filipino women receiving on the tongue, and all these people that I looked at and were like, these people are super holy. And I'm like, they're doing this. I'm like, I'm going to give it a try. And when I did, it changed me. I had to humble myself, but I was self-conscious because I felt like I was going up to the priest, and I was like, ah, you know. So I had to look in the mirror, and I had to change, you know, keep draw it in a little bit. You know, you don't have to go so far out. Or when people come up, I see what I would call, and look, I'm saying this in, 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 in just, in, 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 in a funny way, not out of offense for the Blessed Sacrament. I love our Lord and the Blessed Sacrament. But the way that I'm going to tell you this is to, make, to get your attention of what I'm trying, the point I'm trying to drive home. People will come up and I see lizards, right? I'm like, I got to, I got to, I missed it. I got to, okay. You know, bruh, slow down. Like, you're, you're, you're not a frog eating a fly here, you know? Just give it a little time, and I'll, I'll make my way there, and we'll get it done, okay? Don't be a lizard, okay? I know, it's funny, but it's true. It's true. If we videotaped you guys receiving communion, you would, you'd, be, you'd be like, oh, my gosh. I can't believe I've never known I've done this, you know? Okay, or the biters, the people who come up, they don't even give me a tongue. They're like, I'm like, oh, whoa. Like, whoa, like, leave a finger. Don't, this is not part of Holy Communion, right? So don't come at it with your teeth, right? And don't come at it with your lips either. Like you're a fish, you know? What is this? But people don't know. Why? Because you've never heard this kind of a talk from a priest. You haven't. But you need to. We need to make some corrective measures. This is concrete action, not just a nice talk and a happy song. Concrete action, okay? Now, here's another one. People come up, and they're, they're a bird feeder. They're like this. I'm like, I don't, what is this, right? Am I, do, do, you want me to just drop the host in your mouth from, do you, some of you are like, oh, dang, I think I do that, right? All right. Another one, the slot machine, right? I'm like, give me a little space, just, oh, just a little bit more, a little bit more, right? It's not a quarter. I'm not, you know, what are you doing? This is what I mean. Go home and in the mirror, close the door so nobody sees you and practice this, okay? Practice it. You're still going to think you look like a fool, but please, for me, for Jesus, okay? We, we can turn this around. We can learn to do this better, guys, okay? All right, so you were laughing, that's good. So hopefully I you're not gonna kill me and stone me and, and you know, write the Pope or something. All right, now the proper response, when people come up to Holy Communion, 
Now, I know in a traditional Latin mass, and I'll get into that in a second, they, they don't say anything because it's assumed. They all know. But for most of you, you go to Novus Ordo. So when you come up to receive Holy Communion and I say the body of Christ, the response is not, thanks, Father. <laughs> I hear this junk. I'm like, dude, you know, or they're like, they say something else, you know, I believe. I'm like, okay, great. But that's not the response, bro. It's amen, you know. I don't get it. I mean, where did you learn this? Where, where did people get come up with this stuff? Or I have, you know, because I'm known and I write books and stuff. People come up to me, and in my communion line, they're like, Father, we love your books. I'm like, now's not the time, dude. You know, like, this is communion line, bro. <laughs> you know, what are you doing here? So, amen. Just amen, okay, when you receive holy communion. All right. Now, why? Well, I know why. And this is where i got to be careful. Why are so many people against the traditional Latin mass? I can tell you why. Because when you want to change teaching, or at least play around with teaching, you got to change the way, the method that it's observed in, liturgy. Because when you change that, you can, you can create a mess, and you can get all kind of confusion. All kind of craziness can come into play when you tinker around with the liturgy. Have we not seen that? Yeah, big time. Here's the thing. If you went to a traditional Latin mass community, how many of them would not believe in the real presence? Like zero. How many of them would go to confession? Like all of them. How many of them would practice contraception? Like none of them. How many of them would be cranking out like 5 to 15 babies? Like all of them. How many of them would promote homosexual marriage? Like none of them. So why is this under attack? Because it is. And let me tell you right now, I'm not, I don't know if I'm making a prophetic statement or not. <laughs> Y'all better get ready. Because right now, this new evangelization thing ain't working out too well. Seriously. We got to get back to some basics, guys. I'm not making this up. 90% of your average Catholics practice contraception? Well, what are we doing wrong? 70% don't believe in the true presence. The majority of Catholics don't go to confession on a frequent basis. Really? It's a funny thing to me as a priest, as I see this, everybody comes up for communion, but when the confessions are heard, eh, five, ten people. Is everybody immaculate? Is everybody perfect and without sin? No. No. We're off. Something ain't right. And I get it. No, no priest wants to get up and preach a message that people are going to, you know, try and cancel them and get them removed and whatnot. It ain't fun being a priest today, let me tell you. Let me tell you. But somebody's got to say this stuff. And then when they do, <laughs> they get removed. Even bishops these days. What's going on? There's a spiritual warfare so big right now. So big. Guys, we're in warfare right now. And it's not just out there in the world. It is. That's always been the case. But it's inside. It's in the house of God now. This has been prophesied. Our Lady herself has said that there will come a time, 1973 I think it was, in a key to Japan, Our Lady said, an approved apparition, there will come a time when you will see bishops against bishops, priests against priests. Are we not seeing that today? Like, totally. Because you can listen to one who says one thing. You can listen to another who says another thing. You can go to one country where the, almost the entire episcopate says this. Like Germany, no offense to anybody who's German. Please don't think I hate Germans. People do this stuff. They're like, Father Calloway said he hates Germans. That's not what I said. But if you know how to do a Google search and look at what certain countries are promoting in the church, it's shameful, shocking, and oftentimes outright demonic. The times that we're living in, we're in uncharted territory right now, my friends. And the only way that we're truly going to turn this thing around is to have bold leaders who aren't afraid 
of reigning in the sheep, making corrective moves with great love, great compassion, great mercy, kindness, and all of that. Without a doubt. But it needs to be done. Because if it's not, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Why is it going to get worse? Because you're going to have a whole generation of woke little freaks, basically, on the scene who are going to be running the scene, and it's going to be a complete nightmare. A complete nightmare if we don't have heroes right now. Now. Okay. That was the tough stuff. There's actually two other issues I would love to address, but those are, those are tough ones, and I'm going to leave that for another talk. I've got to always figure out where the exit doors are when I give that talk, okay? Because there's other things that we need to address, other things that need to be addressed when it comes to liturgy, of who should be doing what, of who should be wearing what, and of who should be receiving communion, who should not be receiving communion. Because so many people will say, oh, Father, he got political. This is <laughs> political, please. Trying to save souls. But people will politicize it and immediately, try and just destroy a priest's life because he said the truth. So difficult. you got to maneuver. you got to be, what's that phrase of our Lord? Brave, for sure. But the, the, the cunning as serpents and innocent as doves. Because not everybody is your friend, even here. Remember at the Last Supper, Jesus himself said, not all of you believe. Some of you, one of you will betray me. Now, I'm not saying that I'm Jesus, but it's just the way that it is. I know. Okay, how many of you in a church, when you go, have seen silence? So many haven't. You can go to churches now where they feel that they have to play music, even if it's good music. Gregorian chant, I love it. But do you have to have it on? Can't I just go to a church before the tabernacle and there be silence? Can't we ever go to a mass where somebody doesn't have to step up and on eagle's wings? I'm like, bro, how many th th times are we going to fly that song, you know? And I like this song. It's my mother's favorite song. She had it at her dad's funeral. It means a lot to her. I get it. But are we that afraid of silence? You know, a lot of times I, I lead pilgrimages all over the place. I lead like three, four, four pilgrimages a year. I love them. And I love it when we're silent. Just be there with Jesus. It's a time of quiet. Just chill. I'm going to continue to distribute Holy Communion, and it might take me 15 minutes. Relax. Sit there and pray. But then somebody freaks out and starts, fires up a hymn, you know, and most times they, they ain't the greatest singer. And then it's brutal. Brutal. You know, St. Augustine said, and this is funny, a lot of people quote St. Augustine on this. He, he said, those who pray sing twice. You ever heard that? Right, that's not what he said. He said, those who pray sing well pray twice. That's the quote. Seriously. So I, I know it, it, it's in the intention. Right, but you're off key, bro. <laughs> you know, it's brutal. Just zip it. Just be quiet. Sit with Jesus for a little bit. It's amazing how people are not comfortable with silence. You can't go anywhere. So you can't buy your groceries today in silence. You got music cranked over, you know, the Piggly Wiggly store, Intercom. Or you go to anywhere. You can't go anywhere and be silent. You can't even go to many Catholic churches today and be quiet. We need to get silence back. We need to be okay with that, just sitting there. It's okay. There's nothing wrong with it. Or what about modesty? Woohoo! Let me tell you what I see as a priest when people come up. And this is for men as well as women, right? People coming up in their PJs. People coming up with these leggings on that are so tight. It's like, what story did you jump on to get in those things? It's like, you can't get any tighter. I mean, I'm like, you might as well be naked. You know, stuff hanging out all over the place. And I'm like, if Padre Pio were here, <laughs> what, what are we doing? If you were in the presence of a dignitary or a president or, you know, somebody from another, you wouldn't come in, in, in all casual. We become so casual. Now, that doesn't mean you got to go out and buy a three-piece suit and, you know, all that. No. But if you got nice clothes, 
why don't you wear them when you come to see Jesus? You know, they talk about back in the day, Sunday best, right? And you would give your best for Jesus. But we don't really do that anymore. People come in so casual. And I get it. I understand. Sometimes maybe you're on vacation. You're at, you know, whatever. You're in Waikiki, and, you know, it's kind of, oh, all right. There's exceptions to everything, okay? But if it's become the norm and we're so comfortable now, we got to take a look at this stuff, guys. And I can tell you now, as a priest, doing Catholic weddings are torture. Torture. It's, 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 it's a flesh market. It's like they're charging by the hour. You know, it's like, what is this? You look like a bunch of hookers. Seriously. You know what I'm saying is true. It's shameful. Veil your beauty. Let there be something mysterious and captivating about it that's hidden. I don't have to see everything. We got, we got to get back to this stuff, guys. Okay. Adoration. You know, there, there could be so much good that came about in the world, in the church, in marriages, in vocations, of the priest, or religious life, if parishes had adoration. Perpetual adoration would be great. But even if it was something that was just on Tuesdays, great. Do something. Because the power of what being before the Blessed Sacrament does to your heart, it heals. He heals you. He can restore your marriage and your family and your brokenness. So many people today are going to counseling and taking this pill and that medication, and there's nothing necessarily wrong with counseling and therapy and meds. No, okay, fine. But there's something much greater, and it's free. You don't have to pay a dime. 24-7, as a matter of fact, if you just find one. And chances are, within your sphere of living, there's a place that has adoration. Why don't you go? Why don't you spend a little time with Jesus? He'll take away your anxiety and your stress. Just go in there for a little bit of time. You will walk out unburdened, and things will be in the right perspective. And you will have peace. I know. Trust me. You know, a lot of people come up to me like, Father Calloway, you're amazing. Let me get a picture with you. I get it. Everybody needs a hero. But I'm jacked up just like you. I got issues, baggage, wounds. I'm a product of the world. I need to go before the healing, the divine physician, and just spend time with him. Don't have to go in there and do tons of stuff. You know, you'll pray a rosary or read a book or sometimes just sit there. Just look. And the thoughts will come. Don't be freaked out by that. I don't think anybody made a perfect holy hour but Our Lady. (laughs) You're going to get distracted just like you do with the rosary, right? I'm three Hail Marys deep in the first set of mysteries. I'm like, squirrel. You know, I'm, I'm, it's ridiculous. And I've written like six books on the rosary. You'd think I'd know how to nail one down one of these days. I ain't nailed one down yet. I haven't made a perfect holy hour. I fall asleep. I get distracted. I'm thinking about the emails. I'm smelling like, ooh, it smells like pork. I smell pork. You know, it's crazy. That's fine. God's cool with that. Just be with him, and he will bless you. Confession. I'm convinced that if we want to truly make a perpetual Eucharistic revival, we got to have a confession revival. Because unless people know what sin is... So if you get people to believe in the real presence, and you say, John 6, you know, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, they'll be like, oh, yeah, I believe it. I get it. And they, keep, they go to confession, but they're not willing to give up sin. You're actually compounding sin and your problems. You're not getting better. You're going to get worse. In other words, you can't give what's holy to dogs. Uh, those aren't my words. Those are the words of Jesus Christ. In the New Testament, look it up. Seems a little harsh, right? But it's not. This is what we're dealing with here. If you are falling into mortal sin and you keep going to Holy Communion, you are destroying yourself. And you're committing sacrilege. You've got to humble yourself and go to confession, even if it means a lot. And for a lot of us, it is. I go to confession a lot. I do. I'm so wretched. I'm so messed up. So many of the wounds from my past. Every now and then I think they're gone. I'm like, sweet freedom, baby. And then I'm like, tanked. But I go to confession. And then the freedom that's there, oh, my goodness. Guys, if you have not made a good confession lately, I am going to beg you as your brother and as a priest, go. 
Go. Don't worry about who it is. Look, if you got to find some r- random Nigerian priest, hit that dude up. You know what I mean? I do. I hit them little dudes from India and the Philippines up all the time, right? They, I don't even know if they know English. So I'm, 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 I'm on trauma dump on this dude like ain't nobody ever trauma dump. All right, dude. Take that back to Manila, you know? I'm like, I get it. Okay. If you got to drive to the next town to get that big one out that you haven't confessed since you were in college, do it. You ain't got to look at them. You know, if you, if you got to, bless me, Father, for I, speak your voice, whatever you got to do, you know. But do it. Because you can't hide that from God. He sees it. But he's just waiting for you to humble yourself. It's like a baby, right? A baby, everybody knows when that baby has soiled itself. You can smell it. Nasty. And the baby might be thinking, it's fine. What? I ain't do nothing. Right? Yeah. Hey, you did. Right? When you clean that baby, no baby that I've ever met, if they could verbalize it, would say, you know what? Today, just the right side. Don't worry about the left. <laughs> it's a whole package deal. Right? So when you go to confession, don't be trying to hide stuff and, and not say something. God knows. He's just waiting for you to humble yourself and get it out. Both sides. Okay? Because when you sin, you spiritually soil yourself. You stink. Sin stinks. Saints can smell it. St. Faustina talked about that. Other saints talked about the stench of sin on a soul. You can act like you didn't make a mess, but you did. And if you're a mortal sin, you need to go to confession before you go to Holy Communion. So many people have never heard this stuff. That's why the lines are so long for co- communion, but the, there's almost nobody going to confession. And you wonder why you're not receiving graces and healing and blessings in your life. Because you're offending our Lord by receiving him in mortal sin. I know it's a tough message, but it's a true message. We need to get back to this. You know, here, here's a perfect example. This is scary stuff, man. John 6 Did you know that there's only one place in the New Testament where there are 66 verses in a sixth chapter? John 666. Scary. We all know what 666 is, like Mark of the Beast, Number of the Beast, the Devil, Satan, Lucifer, like bad stuff. So what is that? Well, it's in the Eucharistic discourse when Jesus is telling his disciples, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you don't have life. My, My flesh is true Food, my blood is true drink. And then in verse 66, 666, it says, And many, not believing this, no longer followed him. John 666. When you walk away from the Eucharist, you're walking away from life itself. Where are you going to go? What edible you think you know better? You don't. You don't. It's about time you surrender your prideful heart and your mind and accept this teaching of Jesus Christ and all the implications that go with it. So, whether you receive on the hand, as the church allows you, do it correctly. If you receive on the tongue, look in a mirror. Practice. Don't go to communion in a state of mortal sin. Spend time with our Lord. And I know that many of you, you're you're laity. All of you are practically, right? So some of the things I mentioned you can't do. Yeah, I don't advise you go to your parish and pick up the tabernacle and put them in the sanctuary like I was going to do, right? You don't have the authority to do that. I get it. There are men who do. Pray for them. Pray for them. They are so under attack. Our bishops and our priests, they are so under attack. So many of them want to do good, but they're afraid. They're afraid that they'll get canceled, that they'll get busted, that they'll get the beat down. I don't care, right? I've been a hippie before, dude. I'm fine with that, <laughs> you know. If, if I got to go live barefoot on the beach somewhere, sweet. You know, it don't mean nothing to me. But a lot of people today, they don't want to lose everything. Okay, I get it. Pray for them. This battle is so raging right now. Pray fast for them. Intercede for them because of what's taking place today. Now, I want to say this because I only got five minutes left. And the new book that I've written, and I hate to make a shameless plug for a book, I get it, but don't worry, I don't make a dime off this stuff. 
I have a vow of poverty. It all goes to my religious community, every single penny. My superiors are like super stoked at the moment because I'm cranking out some books that are making mad money for the community. <laughs> that consecration to St. Joseph one was like off the charts. You couldn't have timed that thing better, right? We're basically going to build a new monastery with the money we made from that one. So now, yeah, and we got 21 seminarians. It's really good. So this new book is 30-Day Eucharistic Revival. So what I do in this book is I want to help the bishops. I want, I want to be a supplement to you guys, a little firebrand on the sides, saying the things that maybe you're scared to say because I get it. You think you're going to get the beat down from the guy overseas. So I get it. So I wrote a book for you, dude. Okay? I, I'll be the whipping post for you if I got to be. A few of you had the courage to put your name on the back. And, and the mother of blessed Carlo Acutis, right, she endorsed it. Her, her endorsement's on the back. She ain't got nothing to lose. So in the book, it's got daily quotes for 30 days from the apostle of the Eucharist. Who's that? St. Peter Julian Imard. Ever heard of him? Most haven't. I didn't learn about him either until I was in seminary. But this dude was off the charts with what he did to promote the Blessed Sacrament, adoration, all that kind of centrality of tabernacles and all that kind of stuff. So I have a quote from him, and then I give a commentary, and then say there's some prayers at the end. Super, 20 minutes a day max for 30 days. And you, it's hard-hitting stuff, and the stuff is in the back that backs up what I'm saying so that you can take it to prayer and have that revival in your life, in your heart. Concrete action an action plan so that we can right this ship, so that we can turn things around right now. That's what I'm, I've, I've, I've written and offer to you. And then lastly, if you want to experience a renewal in your life and you have the means to do it, not everybody does, the greatest pilgrimage that you can make is where? To the tabernacle. Free. You ain't got to fly overseas and get jet lag and do all, nope. You ain't got to lose your luggage and whatnot. Nope. You can drive five miles, ten miles to the nearest tabernacle. That's the ultimate pilgrimage that you can make. And even if you ain't got a car, you know what you can do? You can genuflect to the tabernacle from your own house. Ain't no distance for God. It doesn't matter if you're 50 miles away from St. Monica's church or, or five feet from the tabernacle in that church. You should have, as a devout Catholic, a Eucharistic compass, a GPS. You know, if you're standing in your house, where, where, where the hospital is. It's in that direction. You may not know longitude and latitude precision, but you know the hospital's over there. Supermarket I go to is here. Gas station's here. My children's school is here. You should know where Jesus is. So you, you, can, you can genuflect to him in your house. He's cool with that. When you wake up in the morning... Maybe instead of checking the text messages and stuff, which we're all prone to do, I get it, I do it too, but maybe face the tabernacle in that general vicinity, genuflect from your house and give a genuflection, baby, knee to the ground, if you can. Many people have health issues, okay. Because i got to cover every basis of what I say because people will write to a bishop, Father, he didn't understand, I have knee problems. He told me I was a horrible person. Because, oh, Nuts. Everything has to be qualified these days, right? Bow then, you know in your house if you can't genuflect. But do something. You can do this. But if you can go on a literal pilgrimage, like overseas, come with me on a pilgrimage. Maybe I've scared you. You're like, no way, dude. I'm not getting on a bus with you. You're a freak. <laughs> yeah. A little bit, right? But I know Jesus Christ. I love Jesus Christ. I love Mother Mary. I love St. Joseph. I love the saints. And when we go to these holy sites and these pilgrimages, we have such a good time. We pray hard, we play hard. That's humanity, normal. Come with me on one. I'm going to tell you about one because I only got about a minute left. I just got back from one. I go on three or four a year. It's so awesome. I love these things. So my next one is England. And you're probably like, England? Bro, where are you going to go to a pubs? Meh. Might hit up a few, right? <laughs> normal. But we're going to do the holy stuff too. We're going to go to Our Lady of Walsingham the National Shrine of Our Lady in England, amazing stuff. We're going to go to the National Shrine of St. Joseph, because you know I love me some St. Joseph. A crown statue of St. Joseph. There's only about eight of those officially approved in the world. They have one in a Benedictine monastery. It's amazing, crowned, beautiful statue of St. Joseph. We're going to go to the church where Our Lady gave the scapular to St. Simon Stock. You know that's in England. Yeah, amazing stuff. We're going to go to see where great saints, martyrs, we're, we're, we're butchered, literally. 
had their entrails torn out in public, drawn and quartered. We have no idea what those martyrs went through. We're going to go to Tyburn, where they were, they were taken to, to the gallows, where, where so many, hundreds upon hundreds upon thousands of martyrs died in that spot. We're going to go there and have mass. We're going to go to Our Lady of the Rosary Church. If you know Father Lawrence Liu, this famous Dominican who takes great pictures, we're going to go there. It's going to be amazing. We're going to be there for New Year's. It's going to be awesome. December 26th to January 4th. Pray about coming with me. We'll have a great time. So if you want to find out about that and the other pilgrimages that I do, go to the website, fathercalloway.com. I hate doing that because I sound like I'm, like, marketing something. Again, I don't make a dime off this stuff. It's to help souls come to Jesus Christ, to help you trick your husband to come. Honey, want to go to England? New Year's in London, right? He doesn't know that I'm going to be on that bus. <laughs> Hi, right? When's the last time you went to confession? No, I'm not that bold, but sometimes. Bring your delinquent children, right? Family time. Let's go on vacation with Father Calloway to England. So if you want to pr check it out, fathercalloway.com. Love to have some of you guys with me on the pilgrimage. I'm going to pray for you. I really am. If I have offended you, if I have said some things that have shocked you, good. <laughs> but if it hurt and it stung and you're like, this guy's nuts, I understand. It's hard. People even said that about Jesus, and they walked away, and that hurt. And it'll hurt me too. But you know what? I'm cool with that. I love you guys. I want you to be so madly in love with Jesus that you receive him as worthily as you possibly can in a state of grace so that you can go to heaven. That's my goal. Let's go to heaven, guys, together. God bless you guys. Thank you so much.